Thank you, uh, Bashir, for accepting this invitation. Thank you, everybody, for having come this evening. I'd like to start my introduction of uh, our friend and colleague, Bashir Dian, with a vignette. The Arabic verb jabara, from which the noun is deduced al jabr, means uh, to reunite things which have been fallen apart, to restore. Um, in the medical sense, uh, jabara or al jabr means uh, to repair a, a bone fracture or to restore a body which has lost its equilibrium. The mathematical sense of al-Jabr comes from the title of a book, Ilm al-Jabr wa muqabala the science of restoring what is missing and equating like with like. This book was published by the mathematician al-Khwarizmi, who uh, was born in 780 and died maybe 835 or 850. He was born in, Ira in present day Iran, but his intellectual work took place in Baghdad at the height of the Abbasid uh, rule of the Arabic Islamic Empire. So when we speak about algebra today, we speak about something which has been established or Certainly there were several steps before leading to Sanskrit and the invention of the zero, but uh, it traveled to Europe uh, from that time and that place. The other heroes in modern mathematics are Descartes, Leibniz, and George Boole. George Boole was an English mathematician. He worked in the, in the fields of differential equations and algebraic logic. He's best known as the author of the books The Laws of the Thought, which contains Boolean algebra. And Boolean logic is credited with laying the foundations for the information age. This was my introductory vignette. I will come to it later. After having passed his baccalaureate in Senegal, Bashir was admitted at the Lycée Louis Le Grand in Paris following half, uh, nearly a century in the footsteps of his compatriot and the, the first president of Senegal, uh, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who was at the same Lycée. At this Lycée, he prepared himself for the concours to be admitted at the École Normale Supérieure, which he succeeded, uh, where he studied philosophy under the supervision of Louis Althusser and Jacques Derrida. One, or at least I myself, I cannot imagine being trained by two people who are further away than <laughs> Louis Althusser and Jacques Derrida. So maybe that's one of the reasons why Bashir cannot easily be put in a genealogy. He knows his way to avoid that by having these two teachers. He received his aggregation in philosophy in 78, and in 82, he defended a doctoral thesis in mathematics at uh, Sorbonne. Uh, and in 1988, he completed his doctorat d'état under the direction of Jean Toussaint de Santy on George Boole's algebra of log logic. So here's a link to my uh, vignette. Bashir was 27 years old. He had already spent something like seven years in Paris and I imagine him as this young man who wanted it all. He didn't come to uh, Europe to study anything, but he put himself right in the middle of what's being considered at the core of Western philosophy, namely the link between logics and mathematics. In 82, he returned to his native country to teach philosophy at Sheikh Anta Diop University in Dakar where the then president, Abu Diouf, uh, appointed him as a counselor for education and culture. And he became one of the uh, advisors of Abu Diouf. In, in this role, he started to work on, on development and on the connections between concepts of time and development, or economic development and concepts of time. And in doing so, he, 
followed again in the footsteps of Gaston Berger, who is a French Senegalese philosopher who was also born in Saint Louis like himself. And uh, uh, in, in this position, he published a book, Gaston Berger, Introduction en Philosophie de l'Avenir. And uh, a few years later, he edited a volume with Heinz Kümmerle, Ton et Développement dans la Pensée de l'Afrique Subsaharienne. This is the, the piece which I came across when I was a younger student working on, on development. And I, I must admit, I was not really enthusiastic about that piece, with, especially not with Kimale. <laughs> and so I lost sight of Bashir. But thanks to my daughter Judith, who is with us here today, she introduced me to Bashir many, many years later when we were in New York and she attended his seminars. And uh, as you can imagine, it's easy for a father to connect the children with your academic friends, but the other way around is a sensitive issue. So I'm happy that, <laughs> I'm happy that Judith is here today. Uh, Bashir, uh, then in 2002, or from 2002 to 2007, was professor of philosophy and religious studies at Northwestern University in Chicago. And from there, he moved to the position in which he is now. He is currently the chair of the P Department of French and Romance Philology, and with a secondary appointment in the uh, Department of Philosophy at Columbia University. So his field of research and teaching are vast. His interests include, as already mentioned, the history of logic and mathematics, the history of philosophy, Islamic philosophy and Sufism, African philosophy and literature. While doing all this, uh, Bashir was and is a prolific writer, admirably so. So in 89, he published the mentioned book on, on Boolean algebra under the title Boule, l'oiseau de nuit et en plein jour. His most recent publications are in 2011, African Art as Philosophy, Senghor Bergson and the Idea of Negritude. Also in 2011, Bergson, Postcolonial, L'élan vital dans la pensée de Leopold Sedar Senghor et de Mohamed Iqbal. This book, the, the last one, was awarded with a Dagnon Bouveret Prize by the French Academy of Moral and Political Sciences in 2011. The same year, he received the Edouard Glissant Prize for his work, Comment Philosophie en Islam. Uh, this book, Comment en Philosophie en Islam, was published in English with a more cutting title, The Ink of the Scholar, which is half of a quotation is more valuable than the blood of the martyrs. And there's a quotation which comes from a philosopher in Timbuktu, where the blood of the martyrs uh, has become nowadays tragi tragically more valuable than the ink of the scholars. And uh, in, in 2016, he also published Philosophie on Islam et on Christianism. Now, for me, the main challenge is how does this connect to the topic of today, decolonization. And I think the beginning of, or at the beginning of his career working on mathematics and algebra is a wonderful entry point into this because it most vividly and most, uh, how shall I say, unavoidably shows that decolonization cannot be against purifying knowledge f from foreign uh, influences. This can't possibly be because otherwise we would have to purify ourselves from uh, what uh, Khwarizmi has written in his uh, book, Ilm al-Jabr wal Muqabala. So in other words, decolonization is a much more complicated issue and I'm looking forward to what Bashir is going to share with us this evening. Thanks again for coming and taking the trouble of uh, delayed airplanes and jet lag. Thank you very much. <laughs>
evening and thank you for being here. I, first of all, owe you apologies for having kept you waiting, of course, but uh, I'd rather have you waiting than just miss the whole thing because a few hours ago I was sitting on the plane in Paris and we were not allowed to fly because the weather was so bad. So I was just looking at my watch and thinking, okay, at what point is it too late for me to go to Berlin? Uh, so I'm very happy that, uh, uh, alhamdulillah, it ended up uh, happening. I would like to express my, my deep gratitude uh, uh, to, to both of you for this generous introduction and primarily for uh, having me here. This is a very great honor for me and I thank really everyone who made it possible uh, for me to be here. And in particular, of course, you, Richard, uh, whom I'm, I'm happy to call my friend after your daughter who was my first friend <laughs> and, uh, and for having introduced me to, to Halle and to the place, a place where I like to think that the spirit of Willem Anton Amo is uh, alive. And so that is very, very special uh, uh, for me. Um, immediately when I received your invitation, the kind invitation of Halle University to, 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 to come and deliver this prestigious lecture, uh, AMO lecture, I thought that it would be fitting for me to choose as the topic of my presentation a subject that would speak to obviously Halle University, to AMO, and also to Berlin in uh, uh, ways that I'm going to show in this presentation. That is what I'm going to try to accomplish with this very notion of another history of philosophy, what I call a decolonized history of philosophy. And by what, what I mean is that the necessity to rethink the history of philosophy as different from what has been constructed at some point as both history of philosophy and philosophy of history within the geography of an Occident which then defined and delimited itself as some kind of exceptional insularity. Now, let me give you my starting point. On February 26 of this past year, 26 and 27, 2016, the second edition of an annual conference uh, known, it is a, a conference at University of Pennsylvania, UPenn, uh, and they have every year an annual conference known as Non-Western Philosophy Conference. I was invited to this last one for my work on Islamic philosophy and African philosophy. And one key moment of that conference was the general discussion on the need to teach, quote, unquote, non-Western philosophies, Indian, Chinese, etc. And two weeks later, two weeks after that conference, two of the organizers, uh, Jay Garfield and Brian Van Norden, published in the New York Times on behalf of all of us, of all the participants, an op-ed under the title, If Philosophy Won't Diversify, Let's Call It What It Really Is. The aim of that op-ed in the New York Times, uh, which generated quite many reactions, was to say that philosophy departments, as they exist, with the curricula that they generally offer, have indeed no reason to call themselves simply departments of philosophy, when they should be referred to as departments of Western philosophy. Now, there is an assumption upon which most of our textbooks in the history of philosophy are founded, which is that Western philosophy indeed is a tautology, even if most of the time we do not really draw the yet necessary conclusion that in that case, non-Western philosophy, therefore, is an oxymoron. So my point here is to bring a nuance to the simple demand that philosophies from elsewhere uh, be 
added and also considered alongside Western philosophy. I am saying that such a dislocation, a compartmentalization and simple juxtaposition is not what we should be demanding. What we need is not to juxtapose next to Western philosophy, Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, African philosophy, and have a little bit of those. But what we need is pluralization uh, of the very notion of the history of philosophy. And that pluralization is twofold. We need to pluralize the history of philosophy itself, unlike what we find in most of our textbooks. Maybe that is changing now. And then we need to pluralize the languages of philosophy. And those are the two points that I'm going to present and uh, uh, explain. So my first point, decolonizing philosophy by pluralizing its history. We should not think that the relationship between colonialism and the current assumption about the history of philosophy is mere accident, having nothing to do with the essence and indeed the unfolding of a questioning and a knowledge whose trajectory only obeys the purely internal logic that within the unique geography called Europe has given its identity and its destination, its telos, to one type of humanity. When Hegel, during his Berlin years, and he is the figure that made me say that my presentation was somehow called by this place, when Hegel evoked colonialism, the topic was brought in from within the construction of the history of philosophy. So it is not a mere uh, accidental association. When he dismembers Africa, detaching Egypt from the continent to link it to Asia, he also decides, as we know, having read the, his lectures on the history of philosophy, he also decides that the Maghreb also is to be separated from what he labeled Africa proper. He sees the region as territories at the south of Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean Sea, and as such, he concludes that their destiny, the destiny of those territories, is to prolong through colonization a Europe whose mission is to take possession of them. And while he was delivering his lectures on the history of philosophy, he saluted what he saw as the premise of that enterprise when France conquered Algiers in 1830. The same, I'm not going to talk much about Hegel. I mean, African philosophers, when they start their career, all exercise, their first exercise is to go after Hegel and his lectures of the history of philosophy. So you might be tired of listening to uh, that criticism. I'm more interested to, uh, in Husserl, because the same relationship between history of philosophy and colonialism is established in Husserl in his 1935 Vienna conference, when in order to summon Europe back to the sense of its own unity and its telos, he forcefully reminded it that its philosophical destination indeed sets it apart. It would be in the natural order of things, Husserl declared, that India, for example, would feel the urge to Europeanize as best as it could, why a Europe fully conscious of itself and its identity would have no reason, no business whatsoever, Indianizing in any way. So the hippies probably did not read him before they sailed to Kathmandu. But the author, I'm not insisting on Husserl either. The author I want to consider at some length here concerning the relationship between the history of philosophy and colonialism is Emmanuel Levinas because of the connection this author establishes between philosophy, the universal, and colonization or rather decolonization. What decolonization, the post-Bandung word, the word that followed the conference of Bandung which marks symbolically uh, 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 the date of decolonization, 
What the post bandung word means for him is the, I quote him, eruption of the Afro-Asian masses on the stage of history, end of quote. And the threat those masses for him represented to the universal and to what we understood Western civilization inherited exclusively from, I quote him again, the Bible and the Greeks. Much has been published in the US in the field of post-colonial studies about the detestation Levinas had for what I have called the post-Bandung word and about the relationship of his philosophy of the other to the non-European other. I will just choose from the rich literature that it would take too long to cite the title by John Drabinsky, Levinas and the Postcolonial Race, Nation, Other. And inevitably, any reading of Levinas from a postcolonial perspective would quote the declaration he made when he was interviewed by Raoul Mortley, and he said, I quote, I often say, though it is a dangerous thing to say publicly, that humanity consists of the Bible and the Greeks. All the rest can be translated. All the rest, all the exotic is dance." End of quote. I made the precision that the questioning of Levinas' Eurocentrism and condescendence, to say the least, vis-a-vis -vis other cultures, evacuated in this declaration to Mortley from what humanity consists of is mainly coming from American authors. American authors are the ones who uh, have launched, I believe, the criticism to Levinas. I must confess that I don't know the German scene on that, uh, uh, on that topic. You will let me know. But uh, in France, generally speaking, Levinas had the status of an icon identified with the ethical turn in philosophy that gives foundation to a politics of without borderism and human rights. Admirers of the author of Totality and Infinity, and I count myself among those, except other aspects of Levinas. So those admirers considered first and foremost that he is the philosopher of hospitality, of the hospitality for the other. And so they would dismiss what, he can, be, what can be called a kind of post-colonial criticism first by downplaying the importance of declarations he made in interviews, such as the one I quoted. But more importantly, they would argue, and rightly so if, you, if we look at it, they would argue that a question such as the relationship of Levinas to the non-European other would be irrelevant to his philosophy and could be even considered a total misunderstanding of that philosophy. It could be thus argued that given what he says about the face, the fact that I am hospitable to the face of the other, and Levinas insists on the fact that the face actually is totally detached from any culture, from any type of context, it appears precisely as this transcendent face that is detached from cultures and appurtenances and therefore beyond the categories of European and non-European that the post-colonial criticism is trying to use against him. That is indeed true, but the point is that the consideration of the non-European is not at all external to the philosophy itself. It is just not true. It is not just coming from declarations in interviews that could be detached easily from the work itself and in which we should not be reading too much. It is, for example, at the very heart of Levinas' humanisme de l'autre homme, humanism of the other, where it becomes clear that the stage where the other's face visits me, calls me out, makes me feel obligated, is indeed different from the stage that was invaded by the Afro-Asian masses turning the word after Bandung, after 1955, into a saraband of myriad cultures. That is a phrase from Levinas. 
The recurrence of the theme of dance, again, is to be noted here. Everything non-European is ultimately dance. But what should be noted above all is that those others are always perceived as a mass out of which no distinct face could precisely emerge. Of such a word, Levinas declare, declares, playing on words, that because it is a word which is by decolonization disoccidentalized, it is also a word which is disoriented, as the only possible orientation could only come from the, I quote him, so disparaged Western civilization. Nevertheless, Levinas claims that same Western civilization is exceptional and cannot be part of the Saraband and become just another province of the world, to use here Chakrabarti's phrase. Because only that continent stands vertically in the direction of the universal, which dedicates it to the anthropological vocation of understanding other cultures better than those cultures have ever understood themselves, and to the philosophical vocation of providing the norm by which they should get orientation. So the mission may not be any more, any longer to colonize, it still is to civilize. Post-colonial criticism of Levinas has remarked that the tone is the same as Husserl's Vienna Conference. Given the state of the world, it is crucial that Europe be reminded of the philosophical exceptionalism which is its identity and its essence. In the case of Husserl, as you know, the urgency was coming from Nazism in uh, 1933. In the case of Levinas, it is really the, the, the post-colonial world with all these Saraband equivalent uh, uh, cultures and languages. That essence, the essence of Europe to which he is summoning Europe again, remains Plato's no notion of a word of significations that are totally to be detached from languages and cultures, even if there is one privileged culture in which that word is, so to say, reflected, and which therefore depreciates all other historical cultures and is called, has the calling of colonizing the world. Now let me quote here Avram Alpert, who has rightly explained that at the root of Levinas' thesis is the radical opposition he wants to establish between ethical transcendentalism and immanence in being. For him, the enemy is really polytheism. He is a dedicated monotheist, and uh, in defense of monotheism, he wants to defend the idea of ethical transcendentalism and everything else which is not monotheistic ethical transcendentalism for him is in the immanence of being. And that immanence of being, the lack of verticality, which he attributes to the non-Greek, non-Bible rest of the word, would for him lead to the type of paganism that has given, given substance to both Hitlerism and Heideggerianism. Here is what Avram Alpert says. I quote at length. The trouble here is not with Europe, but with the supremacy imputed to it. Ideas from European philosophers remain important, and the geographical abstraction Europe is not meaningless. But when thinkers argue, as Levinas himself did, that the very idea of opening to others was a European invention, or that thinkers outside Europe have nothing meaningful to contribute to philosophy, we need to respond that this is both historically inaccurate and conceptually absurd. There are both other spaces that have produced an ethics of encounter, if that is what is important, and there are other ethics that have been produced in other spaces. The point is neither to insist on the uniqueness of power and power of one geography, nor is it to oppose a way of thinking simply because a cluster of thinkers in a particular region 
espoused it. Rather, it is to engage in comparative work that shows both similarity and difference across ethical formations. You mentioned the late uh, uh, Heinz Kümmerle. That was his endeavor, this kind of uh, comparative uh, philosophy. Comparative work is the important phrase here. And that should primarily mean what I have called the pluralization of history. More specifically, the deconstruction of the unilinear understanding of what came to be known following the medieval phrase as the translatius tujorum, the transfer of philosophy, of knowledge and of philosophy, of Greek philosophy. The translatius tujorum upon which Levinas' conception ultimately rests. The reduction of that translatio to the route Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, the Christian West. It is important to insist that this was a reduction and a fabrication. The Greeks themselves did not think of philosophy as their miracle. And Descartes, the thinker of the tabula rasa, declared about the matrix of his system, algebra, that its very name was an indication of its foreign origin. And Richard uh, uh, mentioned precisely that very foreign origin uh, uh, um, of algebra, which gave the name algebra, and that we owe to uh, uh, mathematician Al-Khawarizmi. And Descartes, who is not ready usually to uh, acknowledge any kind of influence. I mean, he would insult you if you give any genealogy to his thinking, recognize that genealogy, saying that the very matrix of his thinking, because his whole philosophy somehow was built upon uh, uh, his uh, uh, work on algebra. And he recognized that the, the matrix of his philosophy was coming from elsewhere. Same thing with Leibniz at the same time. Uh, looking toward China and so on and so forth. So this comparative attitude, the idea that philosophy is not the proper of Europe was quite current from the Greek onwards until uh, 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 Hegel, I would say. Let's blame everything on him. <laughs> and in the same spirit, Roger Bacon, Bacon, defining the medieval phrase translatios to Jorum, precisely, had this to write. I quote him. God first revealed philosophy to his saints and gave them the laws. It was thus primarily and most completely given in the Hebrew language. It was then renewed in the Greek language, primarily by Aristotle. Then in the Arabic language, primarily through Ibn Avicenna. But it was never composed in Latin and was only translated based on foreign languages and the best texts are not translated. So this is what Bacon had to say uh, uh, at a time uh, very close to the coining of the very phrase translatios to Jurum. What he said here about Latin being just another language, not the language of philosophy that we know, is quite remarkable given the role that that language had to play afterwards as the language of philosophy. But what is most important is the exemplification here of what I have called the pluralization of languages and of the trajectory of the translatios to Europe. The importance of Arabic as a language of philosophy and of the figure of Ibn Sina, Avicina, is emblematic of the larger question of what uh, uh, um, French uh, uh, historian of philosophy, of medieval philosophy, Alain de Libera, calls the necessary pluralization of the field of history, which means here of the languages and routes of translatios to Europe. Thus, the transfer and the appropriations of Greek philosophy have taken multiple paths to Damascus, but mainly to Baghdad, to Nishapur, to Cordoba, to Toledo, to Fez in Morocco, or to Timbuktu in West Africa, present-day Mali. So let me pause here on Timbuktu, uh, 
and make four remarks about that important city in present-day Mali as one of the many receptacles of precisely the translatio studiorum, or the transfer of Greek philosophy. First remark, the fact that Timbuktu and other localities in the region that was known then as Bilada Sudan, or simply Sudan, meaning the land of the black people. So you had two Sudan in, on the African continent. The Sudan in the east, where my very good friend Amal comes from, and the Sudan in the west, of which I was a part because Senegal was part of that Sudan. So Timbuktu, the fact that Timbuktu was this prominent center of Islamic studies and disciplines is a direct response to Hegel's dismembering or vivisection of Africa. The notion that the Sahara was a wall between two different worlds upon which rests Hegel's geographical philosophical construction of Africa proper as a self-enclosed land eternally wrapped in the dark mantle of the night. He is very poetic when he is mean and nasty. Is simply sheer ignorance of the actual history of which Timbuktu is a testimony. Second, what Timbuktu testifies for is precisely a history of written erudition in the Bilada Sudan. And in this case, you have to use the tautology of written erudition uh, uh, because we are not uh, uh, in the habit precisely of associating anything African with uh, 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 writing. But what Timbuktu testifies for is now becoming an important field in African studies. My colleague and friend, Usman Khan, who is uh, uh, at Harvard University, uh, refers to that field as Timbuktu studies, and uh, uh, Senegalese Falungom call it also, call those type of uh, studies the Ajamization of Islam. Ajami being, let's say, Islamic languages that are not Arabic. Third remark, the literature of African philosophy has ignored for too long that written tradition precisely. Now, to decolonize the history of philosophy is also to deconstruct the ethnological identification of Africa with orality, which simply obscures the intellectual history of large parts of the continent. Now, my fourth remark. The main reason uh, uh, the literature from Timbuktu has not been part of the discussion on African philosophy, which took place since World War II, was mere ignorance. People just did not know about it. Actually, Timbuktu really appeared in our collective conscience a few years, a few months even ago, when uh, the jihadists took over the city and people started fearing uh, for the manuscripts that were kept there. But another reason for that ignorance was that for some, for some people, even uh, African philosophers themselves, writings by African Muslim scholars continuing the tradition of Islamic philosophy and in conversation with authors such as Al-Ghazali, Ibn Sina, etc., for example, may not for them qualify as African philosophy because they would question the Africanness of writings that are just in conversation with Islamic philosophy in general. This is again absurd because let me take an example. One of those uh, philosophers, African philosophers who lived in the 16th century in Timbuktu, uh, probably the, the most known, uh, Ahmad Baba, Ahmad Baba al-Timbukti, Ahmad Baba from Timbuktu. Ahmad Baba, I take two, wor two works by Ahmad Baba. One titled Tuhfatul Fudala, The Merits of the Scholars, uh, and the other one, Miraj al uh, uh, So in, in the first one, The Merits of the Scholars, what he is doing is a general philosophical reflection about knowledge, the importance of knowledge for, our, for the realization of our own humanity. And what he says, and this is the work in which he quotes uh, uh, the hadith, the prophetic hadith, actually he quotes it, he, it is not his uh, uh, own writing, uh, 
a prophetic hadith, a, prophet, uh, a hadith from Prophet Muhammad, who say the ink of the scholars is more precious than the blood of the martyrs. And the whole book by uh, um, uh, Ahmad Baba is a reflection on the meaning of that sentence and the importance of scholarship. So according to the people I just quoted, this would not truly uh, uh, um, you know, count as African because he would be quoting Ghazali, discussing with Ghazali, and so on. But then the other book, Miraj al Saud, is a book on slavery, where he reflects on slavery and the fact that you had all these, uh, uh, sla this slave trade throughout Sahara from uh, uh, um, uh, Maghreb Arab people coming uh, south uh, and uh, um, uh, taking slaves. So one would say, okay, he wrote this book which is truly uh, uh, of concern for Africans and the other one not. This is one first absurdity. But more profoundly, translatios to jorum pluralized precisely means that philosophy is not tied to any ethnic identities and I could not agree more with what you said, Richard, about that. Precisely, it is not a question of juxtaposing identities. It is a question of blending them together within one single uh, uh, translatio studiorum with multiple paths. And this brings me to William Anton Amo, uh, of whom I would like to say just a couple of words. Uh, his lost work on the rights of the Moors that you mentioned uh, in Europe may be dealing probably with African issues and his own Africanness. But his work, his main work that we have on apatheia, on the fact that uh, uh, the, the dualism in Descartes between the body and the mind has been too uh, 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 radical and that in some respect uh, uh, the, the mind does feel uh, also, his work on apatheia is sheer German philosophy during his times. And it belongs to the history of philosophy and history of medical science in the 18th century Germany. So he is African all right. He was coming from Ghana, but why would I look for the Africanity in his philosophy? I am actually the director of a series uh, uh, called La Philosophie en toutes lettres, published by Présence Africaine in France, and I have commissioned uh, a friend of mine who is an excellent Cartesian to write a commentary of William Anton Amo. And I told him, do not mention in any place that he was African or black. Please, just do not say it. Look at what he did and look at what it meant within the intellectual context of 18th century Germany, this period of the Wolfian uh, uh, period and what it meant for uh, uh, medical history in Germany. So that was my first remark on this. So in summary on this point. In Tumbuktu and other intellectual centers in Africa, translatio studiorum took place, meaning that the texts of Greek philosophy were, to quote Alain de Libera, read and commented, leading to the conception of other texts, thus continuing the human heritage. And this is the key phrase for me. A human heritage to be continued and not a European humanity, as Husserl called it, with its telos and universal mission. That is the meaning of a pluralization of history. Now I go much faster on my second point, which is the pluralization of languages. I consider the Dictionary of the Untranslatables with the subtitle A Philosophical Lexicon, edited by Barbara Cassin, French philosopher Barbara Cassin, an enterprise, such an enterprise of decolonization of the history of philosophy. Because it is the project of taking apart the ontological nationalism represented by Heidegger, for whom philosophy speaks Greek and now the Greek of our times, which is German. I'm so sorry I have to give my talk in English. I wish I could speak German, but <laughs> I've been bl not been blessed by the Heideggerian God. <laughs> 
to take apart ontological nationalism requires the realization of the simple fact that first, a language is always one language among many that are all complete. Second, that when we philosophize, we do so in a given human language and not in some kind of logos. A quote here, long quote from Edouard Sapir, which I consider post-colonial, explains that better. I quote him. Few philosophers have deigned to look into the morphologies of primitive languages, nor have they given the structural peculiarities of their own speech more than a passing and perfunctory function. Attention, sorry. When one has the riddle of the universe on his hands, such pursuit seems trivial, trivial enough. Yet when it begins to be suspected that at least some solutions of the great, great riddle are elaborately roundabout applications of the rules of Latin or German or English grammar, the triviality of linguistic analysis becomes less certain. To a far greater extent that the philosopher has realized, he is likely to become the dupe of his speech forms, which is equivalent to saying that the mold of his thought, which is typically a linguistic mold, is apt to be projected into his conception of the word. Thus, innocent linguistic categories may take on the formidable appearance of cosmic absolutes, if only, therefore, to save himself from philosophic verbalism, it would be very well for the philosopher to look critically to the linguistic foundations and limitations of his thought." End of quote. So to decenter oneself, and philosophers pride themselves on their capacity to decenter themselves, to decenter oneself by examining one thinking from the perspective of a radically different language, that of the primitives, that is here the advice of Sapir to philosophers who demand that nothing be left unexamined. This is not different from what Edouard Glissant expresses when he declares that he writes in the presence of all the languages of the world. Of course he doesn't know all the languages of the world, but what he is saying is that if you are writing with the full acknowledgement that actually your writing and your thinking is only being done in one language and many other languages exist out there, then you would be writing and thinking differently. In other words, you would be more conscious of what your thinking owes to your own language. It is important here to recall another point emphasized by Sapir, namely that all languages are complete, that no language lacks anything when it comes to expressing the word, translating thoughts, and that it is in that language also in addition is always becoming. I say this, I make this precision because speaking of colonialism, the colonial space is the asymmetrical space par excellence. You cannot have symmetry in the colonial space. So this is the place where the idea that a language is always just one language among others could not stand because you do have the imperial language and then you have idioms, tongues, that could barely qualify as languages because the imperial language defines itself as the logos incarnated and defines all other languages as lacking something. Usually, all other languages are defined as lacking abstract terms, which is absurd. Any single term could be abstract. There is not a word which is more concrete than the word abstract. <laughs> because if I look at it, abstrahere, you trahere in Latin, you uh, pull, up, out of. And from there, you, the word abstract means what it means. And this is what happens with every single word. So to say that a language lacks abstraction just doesn't make sense. But if you are a, a, a colonialist, you do not mind not making sense. 
Second, they lack the verb to be. This idea that the, the verb to be is missing. Any single language can say, I think, therefore, I am. They would not say it that way. Of course, you are just focused, so focused on the Indo-European languages and the use of the copula in Indo-European -language, uh, uh, languages that compared to those, you think that the others are lacking something. Third, usually what he say is that they are lacking the future tenses and, and then uh, um, therefore these people probably cannot really project themselves into some kind of future. They are living in some kind of eternal concrete present. Mind you, Hebrew doesn't have either that future tense. Arab, which is uh, exactly the same, doesn't have it. Although you can have ways of expressing future in those. And the Hebrew, I believe, have invented prophecy. So they do have some sense of the future. The question of languages in their plurality is an important aspect of the philosophical debate in Africa. Very quickly, in 1956, African philosophers Alexis Kagame, nothing to do with uh, the, present, the current president, uh, 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 had published two years before um, uh, French linguist Emile Benveniste actually published something along the same lines. An article, a, a book, a book actually, and in a chapter he showed what Aristotle's categories owed to Greek language, saying that when Aristotle gives the list of nine or ten categories, depending on which of his texts you read, and uh, present them as the grammar of thought in general, uh, uh, Benveniste, but Kagame before, just show that these are the different ways in which you use the verb to be, a i in Greek, and uh, what you say about being in Greek. So all these categories, quantity, quality, relation, modality, action, passion, etc., etc., are different ways of conjugating the verb to be in, uh, in, uh, in Greek. What conclusion should we draw from that? You can have a relativistic, deterministic conclusion from that, which would be to say each language has its own grammar, philosophical grammar, and therefore should be developing its own philosophy along the lines of its philosophical grammar. Or you could have another position, which is mine, which is also uh, the position of a certain number of philosophers, among them Kwasi Wiredu the Ghanaian, which is to say that what it says, what it tells us, is the philosopher should be precisely a translator, going back and forth between languages, not saying this language has its philosophy, this other language has its own philosophy, but testing what we say philosophically in a language by this displacement, this dislocation into another language, exactly the invitation that uh, 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 Sapir was uh, addressing the philosophers. And this is what Viredu did in the very important article of the concept of truth in the Akan language, where he tries to translate, he translates into Akan, uh, logician Alfred Tarski's, Tarski's definition of the truth, showing that it did not make, if you translate it literally, it did not make sense in Akan. So you can draw two lessons from that. First of all, what presents itself as a universal philosophical definition of the truth may not be as universal because it was so tied to the English language in which it was formulated in the first place. But second aspect, once you have said that, it is banal. But the other thing is that if you do that operation of translation, it does teach you something about the very structure of the problem itself, the philosophical problem, which enrich the philosophical problem in its formulation. It tells you something in English and it tells you something about uh, Akan language. So, to conclude in a word, the kind of verticality that Levinas was calling for has to be replaced by the horizontality and the laterality of translation and considering what it means to philosophize in many different languages. Opposing this lateral universal, and the phrase is I'm taking from Merleau-Ponty, opposing this lateral universal to the vertical universal of Levinas and identifying it with, with translation invites us to travel towards other languages to think 
from language to language. And I believe that in our times of ethno-nationalism, we have to uh, uh, meditate that. We have to see what is the ethical and also political stake in precisely adopting this posture of decentering because we need to face those ethno-nationalists uh, by uh, uh, summoning the figure of the migrant, not the migrant that they are attacking, but the migrant which means precisely that, the capacity to travel, the capacity to displace yourself, the capacity to decenter yourself, and I believe it, that this is the lesson of what I have tried to call the decolonized history of philosophy. Thank you for your patience.